Welcome to the 2016 NASA Ames Summer Series. Imagine being on a spacecraft exploring the universe and not knowing how your life support system works and its weaknesses. This, for NASA, will be considered a very risky mission. Planet Earth is such a spacecraft where its surface is mostly covered by oceans that we don't fully understand. Today's presentation is entitled Sushi and Satellites, Tracking Predators Across the Blue Serengeti, will be given by Dr. Barbara Block. Dr. Block is a Charles and Elizabeth Prothor, Prothoro Professor in Marine Sciences, Evolutionary, Cellular, and Molecular Physiology at Stanford University. She is the co-founder of the Monterey Bay Aquarium of the Tuna Research and Conservation Center and is a co-chief scientist for the Tagging of Pacific Predators program. Dr. Block started her career with a Bachelor's of Arts at, from the University of Vermont and began in her oceanography career with at Woods Hole uh, Institute. She earned a PhD from Duke University and uh, did a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Block. Well, it's an honor, a privilege to be here at a NASA facility giving a talk about Earth. And I hope that today I can take you planetary explorers back to our planet and give you a sense of what's happening in the fluid part of the, the world, the oceans. So how many of you, a, a personal question, eat sushi? Everybody. All right. And who, who's having a tuna fish sandwich for lunch today? Oh, someone in the back. All right. So today, I hope that you're going to learn more about one of the Olympians in the sea, uh, some of the animals we study the oceans they move through, and then walk away from the talk with an understanding of how NASA satellite oceanography and NOAA satellite oceanography provides a lot of the background for how we understand how animals are moving across two-thirds of our planet. So the challenge, if I take you back to Earth and we watch the, the spinning sea whiffs uh, view of the planet, is I'm going to argue today that Significant portions of our federal budget should be spent on our planet because we really don't understand two-thirds of it. All right, so our view has changed radically since we've had Earth orbiting satellites. We see the seasonal changes. But the challenge for the terrestrial vertebrate, the primate called man or woman, is we have a hard time understanding the mathematics, the fluid dynamics, and the challenges of modeling organisms as they live in this fluid realm that's not very transparent. And to this day, we're just beginning. All right, we haven't been here very long, and we're just trying to figure out really how this planet works. Now, put in context what I do, I study the Olympian of the sea, the giant bluefin tuna or a white shark. And as they slip beneath the waves, just like a whale, everything becomes non-transparent and radio signals don't work. So how do you study animals who move across such large realms? And what can it teach us if we're trying to go to other galaxies and study other places? I've always enjoyed this view, this NASA view of our planet. I used it many times in a program called the Census of Marine Life, perhaps our globe's largest program ever in the last uh, decade to understand the biodiversity of our planet. I was fortunate enough to lead one of the projects uh, called TOP, and this enabled us to basically uh, study large predators as they moved across the Pacific Ocean, the largest ocean on the planet. So the dots that you'll see on maps today represent where animals go, and part of the lesson today is how is it that we build engineering devices that enable us to see where the fastest animals in the ocean go beneath the waves where you can't use radio signals. And I want you to be thinking about that because the challenge is great. So up until recently, our view of our own planet, coming from this institution too, was one in which 
all we could do was see the surface. We didn't really see beneath the sea. And the level of spending that we do to understand our planet isn't high enough to actually ensure that the next generation of engineering tools, the next generation of computational tools, are getting into our ocean quick enough so we solve the major questions of our time. What's the ocean atmosphere interaction and how is it creating and impacting the change that we call uh, climate? We have to separate the variability from the overall change that we know is occurring on this planet and we haven't yet really spent the time, created the mathematics, created the tools that are allowing us to understand two-thirds of our planet Earth. So then add to that that researchers like myself want to study the animals who live in the planet beneath the sea that's not transparent and try to figure out how they work before it's too late for many of these populations because our appetite across the globe for sushi is actually threatening many populations of animals such as tunas in the sea. So I'd argue here at NASA that the most important thing we do in the next 100 years, the most important thing we're doing in the next 50 years is using some of the technology you're creating to go to other planets right here on Earth so that we can better understand how is it that we will know when our seascapes are changing and what is it we should know to prevent having any big surprises happen on our planet. And we're going to tell you today as oceanographers, it's not easy. And it requires a national commitment uh, to oceans that we haven't yet seen. So I study big tunas. I became fascinated with tunas at the age of an intern in this room, a, a person who basically started as a intern in a laboratory at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and was fascinated because these are one of the few warm fish in the sea. They're endothermic, warm-bodied like we are. They're powerful animals that if you catch one at the end of a hook and line, you may be battling it for hours. So these Olympians are known across the planet to everybody else as sushi. All right, and the next time you have your sushi dinner or lunch, I want you to take a good look at that piece of red muscle, which is really white muscle, it looks red, and ask yourself where did it come from and then hopefully you'll share one of the lessons perhaps that you'll learn today. We've made it easy for all of you to see tunas just a hundred miles down the road at the Monterey Bay Aquarium where behind a wall of very thick acrylic we've got one of the largest displays of bluefin tuna from the Pacific an animal that's now being proposed for an ESA, an Endangered Species Act, listing here in North America. We've also had in the past, <clears throat> excuse me, white sharks. We're the only aquarium that's been able to keep alive young white sharks in captivity. So what's the importance of having tunas and white sharks behind glass? Well, the first thing is if you look at this animal moving, and perhaps can we bring the lights down at all? so that we can see the ocean a little better. You'd be interested to know that from a Navy perspective, tunas are quite interesting. They're one of the most fusiform shapes in the sea. They have the lowest coefficient of drag that you'll ever find in nature. And we're interested in how everything from their skin to their biomechanics is uniquely uh, formed morphologically and physiologically to help enhance these animals as they cross the oceans. We only just in the past year we're able to put a camera that working with a company, we've helped to engineer to do exactly what we want on a tuna so that we can watch the flip of its tail as it goes behind the sea. How this animal creates vorticity may be a secret of how the most efficient machines on the planet, if they were in the ocean, should be moving. All right, these are animals who cross tens of thousands of nautical miles uh, in a year in the ocean. So my real fascination is what makes the Olympians so unique, the tuna. I don't want to give that lecture today, but I've just left you with a few thoughts. They're actually moving like a kangaroo. A kangaroo bounces, stores elastic energy, and then hops again at an almost free energetic cost. A tuna bends its tail, stretching elastic tendons, as we've been learning. 
and actually can bring its tail back to its center position without much muscular energy being utilized. If we could make an autonomous vehicle that's using the biomechanics of a tuna, we might be able to go places further. These animals are powered, as that infrared image shows you, it's heat uh, by warm muscles, and it helps us understand the mechanical advantages, really, of being warm. But when it comes to understanding a tuna's journey beneath the sea, as I've said, they're difficult to study. That's why we know so little up until recently. They're highly migratory. A single tuna will be born in the seas off Japan in its lifetime, swim over to Mexico, spend four years here in California waters, swimming north and south between California and Mexico, go back to Japan, and then take a post-spawning migration down to New Zealand and come back. Largest life history of any fish we know in the sea. How can we study that? So in our field, there's been a push towards small miniature electronic devices that we can put on the animals. There's been a push towards using uh, genomics and uh, chemical markers. These would be elements in the animal that tell us where it's been. Has it been off the waters of Fukushima? And then come on over, we can actually measure that. And then we can begin to put together the migrations. And there's a lot of novel techniques in the last few years that have developed. But overall, these fields aren't well funded. And so knowing simple questions like how many white sharks there are in the sea, how many are there off California, how big is the spawning population of bluefin left in the Pacific Ocean? These are not easy to answer questions. They require interdisciplinary science of ocean science, satellite oceanography, electronic tagging, and uh, computational mathematics to help put together models of how many animals there are. So certainly, you won't forget this, that the next time you go over the Golden Gate Bridge, let me be the first to tell you that our research has shown that white sharks are crossing beneath you and moving into the San Francisco Bay. All right, so we know this primarily from electronic tags, but when you see across the bridge into the surface, you hardly know what's happening beneath you. We know from electronic tags, and I'm just giving you an overview at this point, that we can see in the white dots from satellite tags, I'll explain how they work shortly, we can see where a white shark goes, and the only boundaries for its protection are the green areas barely visible on the map. Those would be sanctuaries and reserves. And you're looking at a third, if you will, of the Pacific there from our shores to Hawaii. And the black areas are EEZ. So a white shark, if we're asking, is this an animal that has any protection? It's an animal that's listed at the highest levels of, uh, of being concerned it's really got this huge open space where it roams. And these open spaces, we've only just been studying. So this is uh, tracks from our satellite tags I'll be talking about, in which a white shark is moving from California to a center place halfway between Hawaii and California, a place we call the White Shark Cafe. And these places weren't even known less than a decade ago. All of the North American white sharks gather in a single place and this single place we've never been to, but we know it exists, and we want to know why. We want to know why because that's a picture that has been generated through listening to the radio signals of AIS. That's what we use on ships to avoid collisions. Our collaborators at uh, Google and uh, SkyTruth have created uh, a program called Global Fish Watch. That's human beings. We're predators, that's where we are. This is just the fishing human beings with AIS. And uh, right in the cafe, we've got an area that uh, humans are actually interacting with. And so we're concerned that no matter what we do for white sharks on our coast, if we have this human predation situation, this is all sort of the wild west of where humans are on our planet, we might have a problem uh, conserving these animals if we can't actually keep track of who's there. I also do what some of you do here at NASA, at Ames. I'm actually a card-carrying animal physiologist. That's what I teach at Stanford. I'm interested in how an organism works from its genes to its environment. I'm interested primarily in the cardiac physiology of how the Olympic athlete, the tuna, works. I think as a nation, we're not really considering enough if we really are uh, headed towards this warming world, what will be the impact on mammals such as ourselves. I study what the impact is on fish, and what we're learning is that 
the atrium of our hearts is actually a very sensitive organ. All right, so what we can learn from studying fish physiology can teach us about what's happening in the world around us of humans, of polar bears, all from studying an Olympic heart of a tuna. We do this by having unusual facilities in Monterey, in back of the Monterey Bay Aquarium at Stanford University. We've got treadmills that allow us to put fish uh, inside the flume and ask the question, what's it like to swim to Japan? And we can find out how these animals operate. We can work with our friends from ONR, instrument the animals uh, all along their bodies or make models and instrument them, and try to learn the secrets of how when they swim, they actually keep flow laminar across most of their body in a way that's extraordinarily unique. And then we can build AUVs or automated vehicles that, that use these principles uh, in the mechanical design. And then most important, even for a mission to Mars, we have to, as physiologists, work together to understand what is resilience in the physiological system? What is it that we need to be paying attention to in a warming sea or a cooling sea what do you need to be paying attention to for an organism that has to travel a long distance without uh, much gravity? And we are at the cutting edge of trying to figure out what are the tools of genomics that can teach us uh, the clear signals we should be watching for in our organelles as we look for these changes that we call uh, adaptation or resilience to warming seas. It's hard to focus on the individual organism when we really have this collective planet, this planet that all of us in this room need to be thinking about, which is undergoing extraordinary physiological changes, but we've only just begun to develop the monitoring system to keep our eyes on what's happening. This ocean is warming along with the planet. Perhaps less understood is the fact it's deoxygenating. This ocean that gave rise to all of life on this planet is losing its oxygen as the physics of warming happens. And then the most uh, concerning aspect of the oceans is as it buffers this planet, the CO2 that's being absorbed, we're getting an increase of acidity. The physiology of Earth may be the most important thing that we're studying right now, and yet the NASA budget probably doesn't have a whole lot in it for this particular enterprise, all right? This is really our future, this planet. Our planet is a planet in which climate change is real, and it's happening, and we can measure it in the seas. And our planet is a planet in which humans across this planet are taking the sharks and the tunas, all of the large predators, out at an alarming rate. And despite enormous efforts of good management here in our nation, we still have to actually deal with the fact that much of the problems are in unregulated seas. So predators are in decline, and when you put a long line in to capture a tuna or a shark, it often captures a leatherback. Every species of turtle on this planet that's a marine turtle is endangered, an albatross, or many other species. This happens because of our appetite on this planet for sushi and tuna. All right, we're at a point where there's seven billion people headed to potentially eight or nine, and now that tuna stocks are down, sharks are becoming a targeted species. I like to remind myself that all of this happened in my lifetime when I was born and the Apollo missions were happening. Our oceans were virgin places, barely understood. I was drawn into Woods Hole Oceanographic, like many of you, to exploration because of the enormous uh, excitement around discovery of the vents. And the 50 years of this lifetime, my own, is the 50 years that a lot of the challenges that we're facing on this planet at the level of Earth have happened. And so the optimism in the room is that we have such great young people, great universities, and that we have to come up with solutions that are based in new technologies. I'm going to just give you one last glimpse of this. This is uh, the Atlantic Ocean, number of hooks. This is when I was born. This is Japan and other nations exploring what it would be like to set hooks in log scale. Hot colored would be lots of hooks. This is uh, when I went to, uh, I guess I must have graduated from high school. This is graduating from college. Red areas being very hot. And then this is uh, when I came to Stanford. 
and now uh, after being a professor. So when we see these pictures, what they represent are hundreds of thousands of hooks in five by five blocks being set across the planet. And because it's out of sight and out of mind, maybe a tuna might sell for a million dollars and you'll hear about it. That's not what most tunas sell for. But it really is amazing how much of the planetary organismal fish and sharks get removed and nobody really pays attention to it. All right, so we don't want our kids to grow up in an ocean, as Daniel Pauly says, in which we're fishing down the marine food chain and that jellyfish will be the future. We want an ocean with healthy ecosystems. So to have an, an ocean with healthy ecosystems means we have to build the technologies of today that will take us into our oceans and allow us to see what's happening, a reef that's changing its acidity, a shark population that's being overfished. We have to use the new tools that we have around us in ways that are really ways they haven't been used. And so my community of scientists have responded to this challenge, first for the interest in physiology, but then because of the conservation need. So we call the area of biologging, the area of being able to take data and telemetry it back, an area that certainly NASA created without question. I can still remember being in my car and hearing about an astronaut who was having its body temperature monitored and telemetry at home and I remember thinking to myself, gee, I'd like to do that in a tuna fish. I want to measure when the tuna eats a meal and learn in the tank exactly when it happens. So we've been building tags with companies for a long time. And these tags, which you might think of as fish and chips type of uh, activity, they're helping us understand where everything goes in the sea. And to take back our seas, we're even imagining a day soon when chips on fish will allow us to catch the poachers. The bigger challenge we face, and this is one of my favorite images of Earth, it's a SeaWiths satellite image, is we don't entirely understand how the ecosystems that these animals live in actually operate. So when we look at a picture of Earth, see if I can get the laser pointer working, we see this gorgeous picture in which the green is the pastures of our oceans, the blue is the deserts, and until I saw that image, I'd learned everything in a textbook about oceans, but then I saw our planet and I realized how it really works. Here are the big gyres where you might not want to go if you're feeding, and you begin to understand why fisheries happen along our coastlines. We have the satellite imagery, but why is it we don't know where carnivores go in the ocean? Why is it that all of you can close your eyes and really imagine what it's like when a white shark, excuse me, when a uh, lion takes down its prey, but it's a little harder for a tuna, a little easier for a white shark because of shark wheat. We don't know the basics, though. We know how many lions there are, how many giraffes there are. We know we're losing elephants and rhinos. And we know that disastrous situation for many animals uh, in the African plains and the Serengeti. But we don't really understand the answers to those questions for tunas and sharks. We barely understand what's going on in Monterey on a summer afternoon cloudy as could be all summer there. We as oceanographers have begun to figure it out. We know that the winds of spring, the northwest winds that are so strong in spring, are creating upwelling, bringing up the nutrient-rich water that then seeds the pastures of summer, and that would be the phytoplankton, that then draws in the krill, that then brings the anchovy or the sardine, and then brings in the blue whale, the humpback, and the bluefin tuna. We barely understand, until our tagging program, where the places like for wildebeest are, in which there might be a long migration, or how the seasonal migrations of the Serengeti might work at an ocean scale, and who'd be at the watering hole. And it wasn't until 2002 that we began actually putting the first electronics on a bluefin tuna who might swim from our side back to Japan and down to New Zealand and back, and hope that we might see that tag again. All right, so the challenge is not only in the electronics, but it's also in that challenge of how do you put things on large objects that move through a fluid medium that has a lot of salt, and how do you keep the engineering going? Or how, like my colleagues in top, uh, Dr. Bruce Mate from Oregon State University, how do you go up to a blue whale and put an electronic tag on a blue whale? And then how do you take all of this 
and put it in a context of a moving fluid that changes at both seasonal and decadal scales and tell a story about how our planet Earth functions. So you, you begin by building a tuna center, which we did in 1994 with the Monterey Bay Aquarium in Stanford. And then you have to convince your colleagues or engineers that this is an exciting area. It's not the most well-funded part of our science stream. But what we began doing, uh, partnering with uh, the Navy and NOAA and many different funding streams under NOP, is we began building the instruments we needed to put on the animals that we could measure what's happening in the ocean. My favorite instrument that we spent a lot of time building is called an archival tag. It's simply a computer. I'd say it has the most sensitive light sensor on the planet. It's arguable, but it's a nine decade light sensor. It has oceanographic quality temperature and pressure. It goes into a fish surgically. The fish carries it in the ocean and we want to get it back up to six years later. That's what we're doing right now and tell the journey that fish took. How do we do that? Well, we have to depend upon humans to get it back. That's not always a good thing to depend upon. So there's a fishery, targeted fishery, in which there's about three or four languages on the tag. It says, return the tag, return the computer. And if you get it back, we're able, underneath the sea, to draw a map of a fish that was tagged here, went up the coast, moved offshore once, all the way back again, and then went back to Japan and got caught. So how did we do that? We did it using the mathematics uh, that was invested in astronomy and sailing from a long time ago. And that is, if I have an accurate clock, not an easy thing to build and keep in a tuna, and I have uh, photons, I can measure sunrise and sunset, and I can actually do mathematical algorithms that tell me where I am on the planet and correct for the diving fish. All right, so that's what we're doing. And that geolocation has now been put into a variety of tag types that sometimes you have to get back, and then other times you can actually pop it off the animal and get it back through satellite uplink. And I'm going to tell you about a whole family of tags that engineers have built around the biologging community that have really led to a breakthrough in understanding where animals go. A second type of tag that happens in animal tagging is obvious to most people. You put a radio tag on the back of an animal. When it comes to the surface, it sends up its signal. But it's harder to put that on a fish because fish don't come to the surface. So we use pop-up satellite archival tags at the top. Sometimes we can take a dorsal fin of a shark and we can put a tag at the tip. We're only learning every day more and more about how to do this. We can send Argos satellite signals. We can now send GPS signals. We're only just as a community learning how to do that well. We help to bring fast lock technology from military applications into the marine realm because when an animal comes to the surface like a whale and goes and gets a breath or a pinniped, it's not there for very long. And so how long does it take to get a global satellite signal? A lot longer than a breathing whale at the surface or a shark who's finning. This is the first shark over the past year that we've put GPS at the tip of its dorsal fin. And what we're able to do is in uh, Tan is our Argo signal, and yellow is our GPS signal. I didn't put the geolocation signal. But we learned that you know, we're doing pretty well with the met methodologies we have, and GPS is getting us somewhere there. But it's hard to get the signal off the animal. So these are the types of tags. The most complex tags we're doing right now are camera tags with magnetometers and accelerometers that tell us everything about uh, pitch and speed underneath the sea. And we're trying to put these on tunas and sharks and find out how they work. But the most important thing we do is we get a lot of points about animals who are the most targeted animals on the planet, about 100,000 points from 2,000 days of tagging, huge amounts of effort catching each fish individually. And in the Pacific, I took this off the web this morning, there's, this is from 10 hours ago, it says Pacific bluefin tuna could become extinct without a fishing ban. All right, so the importance of this type of work is that without uh, finding out what they do, we can't manage these animals. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. This is the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, Sixty nations are meeting next week in Europe, in Spain, to decide how does the science support best splitting up the last uh, tuna for the two different sides of the ocean, and how can we best manage what we hope is a recovery. So we have two populations that are thought to 
not cross the ocean originally, but now we've learned from tagging they do. We manage the western side of the basin differently than the eastern side. We have a smaller stock in the west off North America, a larger stock in the mid. This is the American stock, so this is lots of breeding tunas. It declined long ago, hovering near its uh, minimum down here. Maybe there's an uptick, but then we had a Gulf oil spill, and it's not really clear what's going on. So as I mentioned, we surgically put these tags into the tuna. We let them go. We mark the tuna with a small mark that's green that says, if you return me, you'll get $1,000. And we get fishermen returning the tags. And when they return the big tunas, uh, it's about 22% of our instruments come back. And the small tunas where there's a higher mortality rate in the Pacific, we get about half of them back. And that's a lot to get back from a wild ocean. So then what we do is we compute uh, where the fish went. So in the color is uh, a track of a fish beneath the sea. It's never sent us a radio signal. This is all beneath the sea all done with a geolocation algorithm. It's a probability function of where is the animal. We hook those probabilities together with an error. And then uh, what we're able to do is run a state-space model that uh, over time has improved, telling us where an animal that's completely beneath the sea is going. And what is the reward for your hard work over 20 years is to get tracks like this. The colors are day, uh, months in which the first year of the animal, he was over in America, then the animal went to Ireland, and then Ireland to Spain, and back and forth again, they breed in the Mediterranean. So you start over here and realize that a fish that you met off the coast of North Carolina is really a Mediterranean breeder. So we begin to separate uh, who's who in the ocean. Another example, a fish in the first year swimming right across to Spain, and then the same thing going in the Balearics to breed for three years in a row. And so it's through this type of activity that we can begin to separate populations. This is a population, uh, this is one fish who's gone into the Gulf twice to breed. And we begin to see that there is a, a very, very small North American giant bluefin tuna that's separate from the European bluefin tuna, but they mix on their foraging grounds. We can also see into the ocean with the animal as it dives, it's become a, a sensor. And there's a day in the life of a tuna down here in which the animal's diving maybe to get a cod or something like that. This is the ambient temperature. There's the warm body temperature. The animal is moving along this trajectory. And over the life of this tag, a year and a half of data, you get this gorgeous data at the level of oceanographic equipment. To get the pop-up tag to work took a lot of effort by many people. And so this is uh, pop-up tagging here at Monterey, uh, learning how to pop the tags off first in uh, pens and then building an instrument that was robust enough to work in the wild. Now what we do routinely is put the external tag on the uh, outside of a fish. It's pretty hard to keep it on. It's 30 grams, uh, hard to get it smaller with its radio transmitters. It then does all the computational math of uh, the modeling of sunrise and sunset on the tag. We correct uh, the latitude by taking the zero pressure in blue and temperature and fitting that with uh, sea surface temperature we get from satellites from NASA and NOAA. We then can bring these two models of where the fish is along a known light longitude together and then get that probability. And the hard part about pop-up tags is you have to send that data back. So the tag is small, it rides, records all this data, uh, does some smart computational functions, comes to the surface on a release that you program in, and then sends the data back to uh, Argos system. So then we're able to take uh, imagery from NASA and NOAA, bring it together with the track, and for the first time in our lives, really see uh, how it is that the Gulf Stream becomes, for example, the transporter of uh, the tuna and how rings off the Gulf Stream are places that they really love to go, and then how an animal might probe the Gulf of Maine, look for something in there, find it's too cold, and then go back before heading back down to North Carolina. And so this type of work is challenging to do. So we also are able to, as I said, send back these uh, oceanographic signals, find out how a fish uh, and a population are using the Gulf of Mexico. We're able to see that some of these fish uh, move across uh, to the Mediterranean, as I told you, combine it with genetics such that we can see Gulf fish, Mediterranean fish, and fish that are uh, sort of in the North Atlantic. 
We can use ear bones with elements to tell us from which population red from the Gulf and blue from the Med, the saltier sea the animals come from. And we take all this information and for the first time, we're able to say to the world, there's two populations, maybe a third that's residential in the Med, and we need to manage the mathematics of how many tunas there are with this understanding and tell the bodies that manage the tuna that your models need to have an overlap mathematics and not the separation. Tuna also came into the Gulf of Mexico to breed, and uh, this is where we had the world's largest oil spill not too long ago. And we're just publishing some papers now in which we look at what happened after spawning, what did the Gulf oil do to the animals, and what did it do to their spawn that's going to impact the population. And we do that with satellite oceanography again, coming from both NOAA and NASA, in which along a trajectory of where a tuna is, we can tell a behavior of spawning. That is, we can tell when the tunas if you will, have sex. And they do, like us, some unusual things. I'm not going to go into the detail. They have a pattern up here of behavior of temperature and pressure that you could almost, with your eyes, see is on a dial basis different than the pattern below. And we know from our own work physiologically that petroleum is a cardiac arithmetic agent. We actually showed that. And so we can actually then make some population estimates of what happened when tuna spawn in oceanographic places that are oiled, so we can bring the layers together and then ask the question, what was the probability in the oil spill of a tuna habitat in high probability green being covered with oil and then also having a spawning event occur? And that's how we bring together these disparate fields of satellite oceanography and behavior. I'm going to skip past this because of time and tell you uh, slightly about our other projects. So out here in the Pacific, which is a bit more of the unknown, we have big sanctuaries and we're trying to understand as I mentioned, we've been talking about the tunas. How does an ocean as big as the Pacific operate? To do that, we took all of our equipment, our satellite tags on the heads of seals, our pop-up tags, our tuna archival tags. And the simple questions that we're asking are, if we understand that there's a relationship between upwelling and productivity, how do you get optimum habitat off California? And why does it occur only for about four to five months of the year? Why is the hot spot, if you will, July to November. So we satellite ocean, o oceanographically tagged uh, from uh, UCSC and Daniel Costa's lab in top the uh, e seals off of, off of uh, Año Nuevo. We built special tags with our British colleagues that carried uh, CTDs on the top there. So these are true CTDs like you'd see off an oceanographic ship. They measure salinity, temperature. They now do fluorescence. And we put this on. Uh, animals along with the fast lock a GPS. And we began to get you know, precision oceanography about what they're doing. And what we learned from this type of activity, the elephant seal goes a third to a halfway across the Pacific and comes back to a beach where you can get the data back. We've got the sharks I told you about. Here's some salmon sharks here, some tuna here. We found that we had a neighborhood in our backyard, that we have this ocean called the Pacific. But once we put tags on, we found that from Hawaii to here is sort of an ocean neighborhood. And then in the summer months, from New Zealand, from Indonesia, from the Bering Sea, animals know it's such a great place to feed. It's sort of the McDonald's of the West Coast that they all come up here on remarkable migrations to feed here. And so what we learn by studying many animals and guilds working together as uh, scientists is that the West Coast of North America has a place that attracts albatross, that has tunas, that has sharks. And for the first time, we could separate in colors their different species and their habitats with tagging. And the main result of the project was to learn in red that if you tag 4,000 animals and get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of points, that the hot spot, after you correct for having put many of the tags in the West Coast, isn't just a diffusional place that they go to because you tagged them here. The hot spot is here because it's actually aggregating much of the wildlife of the Pacific in the northern Pacific Ocean. And there's three hot spots in particular. We found the highway, the North Pacific Transition Zone, the California Current, and the White Shark Cafe. We also found that, much to our surprise when we started, we didn't really know this, that if you take oceanographic values, this would be chlorophyll. This down here is temperature, with red being warm colors. And you run the mean latitude of all these gills through the year, that there's a very seasonal pattern of either going north-south or going inshore-offshore, that there's actually a clock that the animals are on. That clock is a seasonal clock 
in which this is the hot spot all of the west coast of North America, and blue are transit periods, and yellow is the residency period. So I've told you a lot about Pacific bluefin tuna. I'm not going to say, I mean, Atlantic bluefin tuna. On the Pacific side, a tuna would be tagged, excuse me, and go north and south for quite some time. And in blue is bluefin, in red is yellowfin, three different species, and white will be albacore tuna. Those are the tunas of the west coast of North America. This would be a NASA-generated uh, surface temperature uh, map from JPL. And what we'll have is then tuna showing you their migration highway home. They always go along that highway. And then we'll see that in red, the yellowfin tuna will be clingy to North America. They'll stay here. That's what makes a population. And then the albacore are going out towards the cafe. Perhaps the biggest migrate, as we learned, we took tuna tags and through the work of Scott Schaefer uh, at San Jose State, we were able to show that with light-based geolocation that animals as small as shearwaters that you see here in the summer are coming up from New Zealand, ending up on our coast, maybe going over to Japan, and then coming back down on some of the largest migrations on the planet. These are with small light-based geolocation tags that the birds carry on their uh, feet. And when we do all this tagging together, we begin to see that we understand that the transition zone, we need satellites to really see this, is between the subarctic front and the subtropical gyre, that an albatross on a single trip will use that frontal zone uh, with a satellite tag, that a Pacific bluefin tuna will migrate along this frontal zone, and so will the elephant seals, because that's where the food is. So we begin to know where the highways that we have to watch where humans might be gathering. We'll use the satellite data to make the synthesis of taking all the data that we have, putting it together with GAM models, and asking the question, what is it that structures the habitat? How is it that temperature and chlorophyll are structuring these places? And then we'll look at something like our elephant seal or pinniped information, and we'll take this to a step further where it helps the planet Earth, where the data that we're gathering as, a, as, as biologists now, as the animals move up and down, is being sent to the world you know, GTS data set, and the animals themselves, as they cross the Pacific and come back with their tags, can actually take more data than any man-made automated vehicle at a lower cost, you know, the cost of a sardine or two, uh, across the entire uh, ocean basin. All right, so this Animals as Ocean Sensors project is something that's grown up out of top. It's happening across the planet. Um, what we do as animal oceanographers is we take our data, we're learning to strip the ocean data from it, send it up to the world system so that we can have a better view of that in situ look at the ocean, such that if this is last year's El Nino, this is my colleague Dan Costa's team, where we're sending out the elephant seals to see the warm blob that developed, and you look at you know, we, the, the Argo float program, a well-funded oceanographic program, and the red are the hot areas, of how much data is coming back in terms of casts, the seals for a very low cost can actually generate quite a bit of data. This has really been taken to heart at the uh, Arctic and Antarctic zones where those are animal tags from five nations uh, in the MIOP program being put out versus the Argo floats in red, uh, which can't really get to some of the places that the animals can get to. So animals are being cohorts in oceanography across the planet. I want to just uh, tell you just a few more stories. This is a satellite tag on a shark. Uh, we didn't know when we started we could send data from the fin of a shark. This is uh, coming down from Alaska, a salmon shark really roving over the Northeast Pacific. Here's a mako over three years, tagged here, one year, two years, and the third year. And then today off the web, this is uh, this morning, a salmon shark we tagged last year, a year ago in Alaska, is right in Monterey Bay. I might go out and see that shark this weekend. So we, again, another story here, learned about this whole other cousin of white sharks. They're enormous migrations with satellite tags. They're, this is the population on the right, a single individual on the, on the left. And you know, I would argue that we don't have polar bear tracks for this long, again, from technology that is allowing us to figure out where they are, what their impact are on salmon. And then the one that everybody wants to hear about are the white sharks in our backyard. Two tags, acoustic and pop-up. Everybody wants to know how we do it. We bring them close to the boat. We don't recommend you do this at home. And when you bring a white shark close to the boat, you can attract them with a seal, decoy, and a piece of blubber. You can get the animal uh, moving right into the boat area. And if you put on a tag like a satellite tag in red, our individual tracks, and in yellow, 
is the whole population. That's how we learn that every shark here on California coast is going offshore back inshore and hanging out at places like the White Shark Cafe. The depth information on the tag gives us the incredible story that in close to shore, this is what you're most interested in for the surfers in the room, they're right here at the surface, red being the high occupancy areas. Once they go offshore, they're doing a dial behavior. And in the cafe, uh, my colleague Sal Jorgensen has shown that they're doing a rapid oscillatory diving. We think this could be behaviorally some sort of uh, behavior that's attracting males and females in the cafe. So they're eating pinnipeds close to home, squid offshore, and the cafe is the place for meet and greet. And in this cafe, we know very little that's happening there. We know it's a concentrated place. We haven't been there yet. We can use satellites to look down on it. And what we're doing right now with our Google colleagues is looking at who's in the cafe. This is now human fishing hours in the cafe using the AIS beacons to ask who is in our blue Serengeti. And note there's very little activity in our North American ocean. That's good. All right, so I'll sum that up by showing all three species now, makos, white sharks, Salmon sharks all moving through space and time in an ocean of color, of temperature. And we see the three species and their shadows there separated. Uh, and basically, the white sharks out there in the cafe, you could learn what time would be a good time to go swimming in Monterey. April looks pretty good. And then these sharks are going to come back, and you'll see that they'll peak on our shore right about coming up uh, in, the, in the summertime. They're just headed back. The first shark showed up yesterday. And then by November, all those white dots are going to be out of the open sea and in to the coastal ocean. We sometimes have salmon sharks get eaten by white sharks. That's a good story there. All right, you can see the body temperature getting constant and warm. But the main story that I've told you today is we, our team, working with many others, discovered that we have a blue Serengeti, a place that's equivalent to Kruger National Park in our backyard. All the animals are here. We're trying now to raise awareness of how do you make an MPA, a marine protected area, that would protect this region beyond the sanctuaries. How is it that we make a Yellowstone in the ocean? How do we make Yosemite in the ocean? So there's a map of the great blue areas. We call these the large marine protected areas. They're not very many in the ocean. Less than 10% of the ocean is protected. Here's the Phoenix Isles protected area, Chagos. Here's our backyard not very well protected. In order to protect these places and look to the future, we need to have uh, apex predator monitoring. Uh, to do that, cool technologies like wave gliders and buoys are being used. Uh, I'm going to finish up by just giving you a couple examples. These are where the animals are from our satellite tags. The black is where the protection zones are. Those are the national marine sanctuaries. White or white sharks. Don't get nervous when you see that slide. Orange are the salmon sharks. It's a sharky backyard we have. We live in peace in this backyard with our sharks. We've uh, developed a system in which we put receivers built by a company called Vemco in the ocean at just a few places. We can keep track acoustically of the white sharks as they come and go. Those are just uh, different white sharks hitting the receivers. We've put iridium satellite devices on the top of our receivers now. And you on your iPhone can keep track if you come into our app or, or take a look on the web of when a white shark swims by the buoy, you can see when it's here. This is, uh, you can see the gap when they're away. This is yesterday. And I just noticed this white shark just showed up on our coast. So you can do that by going to top.org and going to a buoy. These buoys have physical oceanography. Uh, they're built in collaboration with uh, Mbari now. And we've got a few of them in the ocean right at Hopkins. We can tell our undergrads, hey, look, there's 14 large white sharks that come by. The gliders give us continuous coverage. And the future of oceanography is to begin to enable this mechanized world that samples, allows us to go in, do things like go around Farallons and see with a mechanized glider, all in yellow, that white sharks are circling the Farallons. Not a great place to go swimming in the summertime. That's a, a bunch of different white sharks all gathered there that we couldn't visualize ourselves until we had gliders that were circling. So in conclusion, the future really is a future in which we bring together these disparate worlds of, of surveillance, technologies that are latecomers to our oceans, 
that you probably are using on other planetary missions. And we begin to understand how is it that we can see what's happening in our sea. And that's what we're trying to do with our colleagues uh, right now. And the future is something like having not only the mechanized vehicles and the tagged animals, but also developing this world of environmental DNA, being able to do signatures, of being able to see where the animals are and also pick up their signature from their genetic material. So an evolving area of science is the fact that wherever you go, especially in the sea, you can find the shedding cells and tell who's been there. We envision the day soon where we'll, we could just send out a glider to the cafe, and the glider remotely could sample what's happening there and send it back to the lab, something you'd be doing on Mars, perhaps. And then we envision the day soon where we take back our seas from the poachers that with the Google and SkyTruth-enabled ability to follow where humans are, that we can actually, in these remote places, the largest MPAs on Earth, build the type of devices that help us prevent uh, the taking of the sharks. I'm going to just go back, back right past this very sad story. The largest MPA on Earth where we work, completely overrun with poachers that we can't stop. And I'll end on this last note. My hope for the future is that with coming together of different groups. We can do things like build what we're building right now with our Stanford colleagues in aerospace, the fin alert shark tag, a tag that when we take a shark from the sea, it will have the same type of device we have in clothes at Macy's where it will alert the patrol boats that the animal's been taken and the patrol boat can come and say, hey, you know, you're not supposed to be in our MPA, our marine protected area. That type of technology is what we need combined with the satellite technology to own this place called Earth and to prevent what's happening, the decimation of the large marine predators uh, in the open sea beyond U.S. borders. So I'm going to end by saying uh, thanks for listening. Uh, monitoring with technology, bringing together these disparate paths is really the future of our oceans. And uh, to do all this work, there's many people I would have to thank, but I particularly want to thank my own laboratory that actually has led the charge with me throughout the years, many different people. And then the combination of philanthropic and federal funding that's allowed us to span two ocean basins uh, in pursuit of a healthier ocean. Thank you very much. So we have time for a few questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand, wait for the microphone, stand up, and one question only. Hi, thank you for the talk, that was great. Um, I'm wondering, when you're making these global conclusions on fish trends, how do you deal with the potential for oversampling of fish in this region and maybe undersampling of <clears throat> populations that are based in Latin America or Australia? Okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm not entirely sure exactly which particular aspect of the study you're, you're, you're focused on, but let me just talk about fish trends. The, uh, Fish in the world are reported to uh, regional fishery management organizations that are international called RFMOs or to FAO. And so most of the grids for fish reporting are uh, five by five grids and all you're getting is what humans tell other humans they're doing. So there's a lot of illegal fishing too, but most of what you're seeing in graphs is reported fishing pressure. And there's been study after study across the planet that's shown that the trends are you know, going down. It's called the fishing down of the food web. I mean more when you're tagging fish, how do you, how do you deal with mic. tagging only ones that are in this area or tagging sharks? Okay, first. so I, it, when we tag and we look at where an animal goes, we have to actually account for that tagging area. So we either have to do a statistical uh, robust analysis in which we have to measure how many animals do we tag, what was the length of a tag on, how do we deal with dispersion versus advection? So it's, it's just a math model. I'm not, maybe I didn't get your question exactly. Hi, that was fascinating. I have two questions. The first question is, when the animals are going out way offshore, they're crossing deserts. I mean, are they going deep? I mean, are they, their surface waters are, are oligotrophic. So how are they managing, and they don't seem to be following currents, they seem to be going counter currents. So what have you learned about that aspect? And then I have another yeah. question. 
I think that's, that's a really great question. That's sort of the secret of the planet Earth. So the biggest peanut butter shop on the planet is in what we call the mesopelagic. So that's the layer underneath the open sea, so the pelagic. And um, in that layer is a fish with oil that may be the real peanut butter of the sea called a lanternfish. So a lot of these animals are diving down to that layer that doesn't have light, the mesopelagic, or it's got low light, feeding in that sometimes low oxygen layer, sometimes not low oxygen, and then coming back to the surface. So we see a lot of that dial behavior out in the open sea. And so there's, there's three parts to the answer to your question that, that we study today. How are these animals so efficient in moving? That is, how is it that they don't have such high energetic costs that they can do that? They can use planetary scales that we could only dream of with a rover or an AUV. So every AUV on the planet, what limits where it goes? Anybody? Batteries, right? OK, so unless you have a solar powered AUV, you can't go very far on the planet compared to a tuna. And so what the animals are doing is they're combining elastic energy storage with mechanical muscle power. Once they get out there, it's a desert. So the question really is, where do you feed? And the answer is you're feeding below the surface satellite imagery. And I think the cafe is a great example where, you know, by surface signal, we would never know that that was a place that all the white sharks gather, or would we know why? And so when we go there physically, perhaps for the first time, where we've applied for some cruise time, maybe what we'll find is what I think is going on. And that is that there is an edge there that we don't naturally recognize as vertebrates, as primates. The edge is formed by a hypoxic layer and a very well oxygenated piece of the ocean. And maybe along that frontal boundary, that's a kind of frontal boundary that we don't normally see from the surface, there's a stack of like cordwood of prey, or maybe it's for some other reason. But I think what the animals are teaching us is we don't entirely yet understand our planet as to where the carbon gets stored that then makes for a good food web. Well, that's interesting. There may also be some metabolic issues because it's lower temperature. But the follow-on question I have is that the ocean is an acoustic environment, not a visual environment. Have you thought about look, listening to the animals as they're moving through the ocean, and not only to understand what they're doing, but also to learn about the surrounding environment acoustically? Yeah, it's a superb question. I'd say that we vertebrate researchers, especially in fish, are behind on the acoustics. We actually, for the Navy, did a project where we measured tuna's capacity to hear. It's quite good. And so I think what probably is going on that we haven't ever put a perception on in terms of a human perception of how it works is that certainly when things move through the ocean, there's sound signals, right? How a fish would pick that up isn't something anybody's you know, done at the pelagic level very well, but perhaps, perhaps it's working. I think that smell is certainly big. You look at a marlin, a tuna, swordfish, they've got a very large rosette that is nasal. So clearly the smell of a squid, you know, maybe something they can pick up. I mean, I get fascinated primarily by simple questions like this. How does a giant tuna swimming in the North Atlantic decide to go to 1,000 meters and do it in less than 10 minutes. You know, how did it know that there was something worth chasing down there? So how does it find the squid that's down there? And wouldn't you love to see from a camera what's really going on? Imagine all of you who spend every day wanting to go to some other planet. We've barely seen what's on this planet at depth, all right? We've been to the Marianas Trench. We've been to some of these incredible places, but do we really understand Places like the open sea, what's happening? In the richest, most biodiverse region, the mesopelagic, which covers the largest zone of the ocean. So we oceanographers have been behind it, sending our message out. We're perhaps not as articulate a crowd as our colleagues of this institution. And I think that you know, there's some really clear issues across 2 thirds of the planet that have to be sorted out. And I think that you know, it's challenging to make it compelling. Hi, thanks for coming to talk to us. Um, I had a question in terms of, you talked about a lot of different technologies that are being developed. In terms of, one, establishing MPAs across, for California and then sort of su supporting the establishment and retaining them, 
what types of advancements in technologies or developments do you see? Is it sort of supporting like population or looking at species or maybe you could speak a little bit to that. Okay, and that's a, that's a terrific question, a very hard question too, so thank you for the difficult question. And um, I don't think we have a clear answer to that question. I think that many of you may know that uh, there's been an act passed in California that protects very important domains that are inshore, so the Marine Life Protection Act. That means that 100 years from now, you know, your kids' kids might be able to see what happens in a California intertidal zone that's almost undisturbed. So it protects small places close to shore. We have sanctuaries now. And these sanctuaries, such as Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, the Gulf of the Farallon Sanctuary, Cordell Bank Sanctuary, they protect larger parcels of the ocean that are quite important. But they still allow fishing and many activities to occur there. There is a push going on right now by, uh, by the West Coast folks in, in oceans to now take seamounts and through the Monument Act, uh, put those out of reach of certain types of fishers, the fishers who can drag a net along a seamount and change the biodiversity overnight. So that is an is a uh, Antiquities Act type of protection that might go in play at the end of the Obama administration. What other tools do we have to protect pelagic areas? Very few is the answer. Even building a World Heritage Site, you know, the same type of site that might be around the Great Barrier Reef is something that's very unique to a temperate zone like ours and doesn't necessarily come with a lot of protection as much as it raises the profile of an area. So the answer is, that's our challenge. How do we tell the fleets of boats that we are seeing now that we have the AIS tool? So remember, the biggest tool that came of age in the last two years is the capacity to use a collision avoidance system as a way to see what humans are doing on the planet. And it's been shocking to see all the nations out beyond our borders who are fishing every last fish they can get so we may be the best at making laws that conserve and manage our fisheries. We do quite well as Americans. But just beyond our borders, where the animals are coming in from, we've got many nations. And I'm not going to name names, but the fleets are big. I'll name some of the biggest fleets, uh, China, Korea, uh, Japan. And they're fishing in the offshore realm. So we won't save that part of this planet until we come up with ways of monitoring. And monitoring can only be done with satellites and with tools that would allow us to count you know, what's being taken. So my dream is beyond the tag I told you about, unfunded, I call it fish chip, is to chip the carcasses tomorrow, not, not you know, 10 years from now. So by chipping the carcasses with a satellite chip, that it isn't as easy as you think. You want to have iridium, you want to have uh, RFID, you want to be able to see an animal in container chip, so you need GPS, Iridium, a bunch of different technologies together on the chip, so that we can't have a black market of tuna, toothfish, you know, other people might worry about rhinoceroses, but you want to be able to chip the wildlife so it can't be traveling the planet without us knowing. And I think we could do that as soon as people come together and say, we care about these problems. So with that, Please join me in thanking Dr. Block for an excellent <laughs>